Welcome back to Better Help's In Session series. I'm Hesu Joe, a licensed therapist and part of the clinical operations team here at Better Help. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we want to take this time to celebrate the progress that's been made in destigmatizing mental health in recent years, while also highlighting how to navigate therapy once you decide to get started. To celebrate alongside us, we're excited to be joined by Dr. Courtney Tracy, or she is most commonly known across social media, the Truth Doctor. Dr. Courtney is a licensed psychotherapist and clinical entrepreneur. As the CEO of Exist Centers Mental Health Treatment Center, specializing in treating millennial and Gen Z individuals, and as the creator and host of the Truth Doctor platforms, Dr. Courtney truly lives her purpose by creating spaces where people can learn the truth about how their body, brain, and mind work. Dr. Courtney, thank you so much for being on our In Session series. To kick us off, we'd love to hear about what brought you to where you are today working within mental health care. Well, thank you so much. It really is an honor to be here. And I think that's a really great first question um, because what brought me to you know, creating the platforms that I have online today and being known as the Truth Doctor was actually in the beginning of 2019 when I went through something very difficult with my family as a therapist. Um, I think I was waiting on my license number um, when what happened happened. And I actually spiraled pretty intensely, um, even as someone who had you know, years of clinical experience, my trauma and stress and overwhelm caught up with me. And what I ended up doing was thinking about how I felt like I knew every therapist in my local area, and I didn't know how I was gonna get help and how I was gonna be able to be a human being and a licensed professional. And so I actually turned to online therapy. And this isn't even, you know, intentionally to be a plug for, for better help, but I searched through many of the online uh, platforms and actually, you know, subscribed to multiple of them. So I had many therapists and I ended up um, using better help as a therapist back in 2019. And I felt better. I felt like I was getting better. And that was in the summer of 2019. And I started my platforms in the fall of 2019 as the truth doctor after I felt more stable and more capable. And what I do is just tell my truth about how it, it doesn't really, I mean, it matters what you know about the ability to take care of yourself, but but you're still just a human being, everyone is, and we can all get overtaken by things that are too much. Um, so I knew life was too much growing up, that's why I became a therapist in the first place, but, but I realized that more people needed to know that it's okay to break down, even when you're an adult, even when you think you should know what to do, sometimes, sometimes you just don't and you have to reach out for help. Thank you um, as a person to a person for bringing so much of yourself into the work that you're doing. Uh, it is not easy to overcome um, challenges, difficulties, some kind of crisis, especially in our families, and then to turn that around and become a very impactful, helpful person to so many others that are experiencing something similar. Um, really commendable. So really appreciate you doing that. Yeah, and thanks. Um, you know, it sounds like you had already set forward on this journey into the world of mental health. Something happened, shifted a direction a little bit to go beyond just working with clients one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and even as a licensed professional, I'm hearing that we can learn, continue to learn things about things that we think we know. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if this answer would be different depending on you know, pre and post this situation that you went through, but when is the right time for someone to look for therapy? You know, I know a lot of people out there are thinking like, well, obviously if I can't get out of bed or if I'm having panic attacks every day, I might consider talking to someone, but what are some other things that somebody could consider in terms of the right time, if there is such a thing? That's a great question. And I definitely think that it would have a different answer because you made a good point that sometimes it's obvious when we need to ask for help when we truly can't get ourselves out of bed when we're having panic attacks daily when our relationships are falling apart or we feel totally isolated and at the same time i think it's important to realize that we live in a day and age where we aren't really given 
the tips, the tools, the education that we need ahead of time to sort of prevent us from getting to those places. And so, yes, it makes sense to get therapy when things are really bad, but at this point, it makes sense to get therapy because we deserve to know how to prevent getting to those places. And that's really important too. The relationship with a therapist and or just the therapeutic process overall provides education. It provides preventative skills and preventative tools so that you don't find yourself unable to get out of bed. And I think that that's, you know, some of the stigma relates a lot to people's inability to see that that therapy can be helpful in many ways, not just to solve problems, but to prevent problems. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, you mentioned something that's like so closely associated with therapy now um, in some good conversations and some still unfortunate, which is stigma. It's still very stigmatized in a lot of communities to consider doing something like this. So I was wondering if you could you could talk about your experience thus far in the in the few years that you've been making such huge moves here um, about changing perceptions, not just in this online space, but in in your real life real life communities <laughs> also. Um, what is there to be said when it comes to changing perceptions as it's related to stigma? That's a, another great question. I feel like I'm going to say that each time you ask. Um, yeah, so much has shifted over the last three to four years. And, you know, I could say that these are my, you know, anecdotal experiences as a clinician, as someone who went through what I went through in 2019, as a mental health content creator that blew up through the COVID pandemic. Like there's lots of things to consider when we're referencing, at least for me, these last a uh, few or four years. Um, and, but I think what it really came down to was that that global shift as a result of the pandemic and everyone sort of being forced to introspect tor in towards themselves, but also in their careers, in their relationships, in what is causing my problems. And, and now these problems are unavoidable if I already had them. And so I think what happened was we all we all felt a little lost and we were all looking for language to express how we were feeling. And over the last few years, as we've seen on on some you know article headlines, therapy speak, therapy talk uh, became ways for people to communicate their pain and their suffering and their distress. And so I think that that contributed to a reduction in, in seeking out mental health help overall um, because it, came, it became more of a unifying discussion. But I also think, and, and certainly not to brag as I'm not the only one, but I also think that mental health content creators throughout these years have really allowed people to, one, see that therapists aren't, you know, just these old white men with very you know particular views on the world and and yes that's what that's really is what our at least western field of psychology was rooted in or our european field of psychology um but more voices were able to be shared over these years um bipoc voices lgbtq voices voices um to show that therapists and the therapy field have more of an understanding of systemic causes of mental health issues, understand that there are some problems that cause mental health distress that are not the result of the individual. And I think it's making people trust our field more and it is more trustworthy now than it was before. Um, and it's letting people be seen and feel like they know what to say about how they're suffering and where to find relief. And I just don't think that we were in a comfortable enough place many years ago um, to outright say that I'm suffering. Even if we're using words that aren't accurate to describe our symptoms, we're attempting to get out there and say, this is what I need and this is what I'm experiencing and I'm okay with asking for help at this point. Uh, you you're talking about like trends and, and the ways that people are kind of influencing the movement of the field. And um, 
I heard a lot of positive trends and a lot of changes that have happened recently. Uh, what do you think is contributing to this forward movement in the field overall? You know, I really, I think about the purpose of our field and, and that will one more people have an opportunity to enter this field and then they get an opportunity to say, what is the purpose of this field? It's not to maintain the status quo, it's to allow people to feel safe and secure and understood. And the people whose voices were marginalized or minimalized are no longer experiencing that. And so it's necessary for us to listen. It's necessary for us to shift. And I think that we are more comfortable as clinicians, at least I think, you know, more so the younger generations of clinicians than maybe those very seasoned and very much knowing their ways that they work. Um, we're more capable of saying we need to do this differently and more people need to be included, even in research studies. How can we say that this thing helps people when we aren't giving an accurate proportion of people that are being, you know, put into these studies to show effectiveness of modalities or certain skills. Um, we're just at a place, I think, where purpose and meaning, which may sound woo woo or fluffy, is really important, not only on the individual level, but on the why are we doing what we are doing? Whether we're therapists, teachers, police officers, parents, employers, why are we doing this and how can we be helpful? And with therapy, we are supposed to be one of the most helpful fields. And so it's time that we started learning how to help all of those that need us and not just, for example, those that you know have convenient places to get that help or have the ability to do so because of insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really liked what you said about um you know, the purpose and the meaning behind what our field is, is you didn't say this part, but I'm kind of getting this as like, some of that has been lost along the way. And at least for a lot of folks that have apprehension or hesitation around entering therapy, it could be because the purpose and meaning has been lost along the way. Um, so what would you say to like that thing? How is purpose and meaning being lost attached to stigma? And how is that associated with stigmas may still remain for a lot of people um, considering looking to talk to somebody? I had to stop myself from saying that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what came up for me was, was one way I think that that mental health and mental illness have both been destigmatized. Um, is because we're realizing now that there's actually purpose and meaning to our symptoms, that our bodies and our brains are saying things to us about issues that we're having. And that in turn is allowing us to realize, okay, if there's a purpose and meaning, which, you know, it, I, I get what I, I think it's important that I say that um, it's not everything happens for a reason and let's find the benefit to your pain. I mean, we do probably want to do that in therapy, but that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is for you to understand that these messages are important. They do have a purpose and there is meaning within them to say either this life is too much, this job is too much, this relationship is too much, this level of stress is too much. And we find ourselves saying, okay, now that we understand, now that, you know, me as a, a potential client understand the purpose and meaning of therapy, which is to provide me education and tips and tools to deal with these symptoms. And I understand that there's purpose and meaning behind my symptoms in general. I think it makes it feel like it's less of um, fix me, I'm broken in therapy and more of I've gotten to this place and I'm not quite sure how I got here, but I know that you can help me with education and skills so I can get to where I want to be in life. It's become a lot less pathologized um, and I think actually a lot more preferred for many, many people, not only for themselves, but for the people that they love around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I can get into a place of feeling good about like, it seems like a lot of doors have been opened to people that previously would have not considered talking to someone. 
I think, I think we're kind of getting to, and we're chipping away at this idea that people still have some fears when it comes to talking about mental health, talking about therapy, talking about I'm in therapy, talking to somebody else about thinking that maybe you should consider being in therapy. <laughs> um, so as the truth doctor, I see, I would imagine that you're observing so many different kinds of truths for people out there. And the reality is like, as much as I'd like for all of Gen Z and millennial people <laughs> to be, um, totally cool about talking about it. I think I've seen that there are still some folks that have some fears when it comes to being very open about this stuff, especially in certain contexts, different settings. It's like, it's okay to talk about it here, but definitely don't want to bring it up there. Um, so what are your observations when it comes to these fears that still exist for so many of us? Like what is so scary? Do you think about talking about therapy and mental health in general? Well, I think, well, obviously the stigma makes it scary, right? We could have this this whole conversation about how um, mental health and mental illness and, and th the therapy process is becoming more normalized. Um, and someone could easily be listening to this going, not in my house, not in my relationship. And that's totally valid and likely very true um, if that's where your mind is at. And, and so I think, you know, Right now, a very common phrase is um, when you open up about your mental health, it's, wow, you were so vulnerable. I'm so proud of you for being so vulnerable. And the definition of vulnerable is being at risk of being harmed physically or emotionally. So basically when we're saying like, we're so proud of you for being vulnerable and opening up, we're saying we're so proud of you for risking getting hurt. And I think that that's a large part of it. It's people know that they are currently at risk of being hurt or judged or accused or fired or divorced for saying, I'm not mentally well right now and I need support. And I think a big part of it is that it's scary for other people to say that. So, you know, take, take somebody in, in a relationship they're both really struggling, but one of them feels like they could never open up about it. And then the other one finally does, but that scares the person that is too afraid to open up. And they think, oh no, I haven't even dealt with my own problems. Now my partner is having problems and it becomes like, you know, I, I, this isn't really happening. Like it's not that big of a deal. Let's not address it. And so I think a lot of it is that we look for support in the people around us, but those people may not be ready to even support themselves. And so how can they support us? So it gets scary because we're not walking around, um, you know, everybody that's safe to open up to is wearing a pink shirt and everyone that's not safe to open up to is wearing a white shirt. It's really hard to determine who is really going to be willing to listen to you. Um, and I think that that's actually a benefit of, of therapy is that it's confidential and no one has to know that you're getting therapy. Like no one knew I was getting therapy in 2019, like no one in my community. And I was a therapist, like someone would know in my personal community, um, but nobody did. And so that's that's just another benefit of, of seeing a therapist is they, we um, respect you for coming in because we know how difficult it can be to do so. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips for folks that are listening in right now and they have themselves some fears when it comes to opening up, talking about stuff, reaching out to somebody? Um, yeah, any, any tips for them to start them off on this journey? Yeah, well, I mean, let's say you make it to a point where you're in your first appointment with someone and you're talking with them, texting with them, meeting with them over, over video. I think like oftentimes the assumption is, and this is okay if this is what happens, like I'm going to like explain my whole life and all of my pain in this first session when I don't even know who you are. And that can be really alarming and, and it can be really preventative. Like I'm not gonna go because I don't wanna do this. And sometimes the first few sessions are just addressing that you don't even know what to say, that you don't even know how, why you're here. You can't believe you actually made it to the appointment. And, and that's okay because, again, 
every way that we act, every symptom we feel, everything we say and perceive has meaning. There's a purpose behind the fear and behind the anxiety. So that's important to know going into therapy is we are trained and taught and ready to just sit there with you in discomfort if you want, or listen to music in the first session if that makes you feel less overwhelmed and less, yeah, anxious. Um, but I also think when it comes to just opening up to anybody in your life to say like, you know, I feel at least more comfortable with this person than a therapist I don't know. Let me at least check in with them, see if they even think therapy is a good idea. Something to think about is if you aren't quite ready to reach out to someone in your life is to pay attention to the ways that they um, comment on other people, you know, or the way they comment on characters in TV shows even. Like you can see people's perspectives on emotions and pain and struggle um, when they're not talking about you at all. And that's actually a good way to gauge it. Will this person be safe for me to open up to, or will this person not be safe for me to open up to? For example, if you have a parent that's just constantly, you know, criticizing and saying negative things about your aunts or uncles or their parents, whatever, somebody, you might, you might think, um, maybe this isn't the best person to reach out to as they seem to sort of be a little bit more opinionated than what I'm looking for. Maybe I'll go and talk to my friend, Jake instead, because he seems to really be open to people that are different than him, that experience different things than him and so on. So it, you don't have to jump in with, um, I'm going to take a chance and say, hey, I'm struggling and I want you to know. It can be, what are some of the qualities that I'm looking for in someone that I think that I can open up to and that can try to help me determine next steps? Mm -hmm. Those same qualities that you notice about people might be stuff to look for once you are looking for a therapist. So I think those are great tips. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned a little while ago, something about like younger generations in terms of like therapists, as well as the clients. And I know you work primarily with millennials and folks in Gen Z, um, what, what things have you observed in terms of maybe shifts in attitude, if any, um, and, you know, any of these differences that you, I think, are thinking about when you're referencing these, um, you know, younger generations, I guess, how would that compare to something, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 ago and, and beyond? Yeah, well, millennials and younger had so much more access to information and we develop our personalities you know, into our mid twenties, I would say, of course, um, personalities are semi-flexible throughout the entire, you know, l life course, but it does take really major things to impact our personality traits. Um, but that's really critical. If you think about those, those years, you know, even just teenage years to young adulthood for millennials and Gen Z, there was so much more access to share our pain, to hear other people's pain, to realize that we don't know what we don't know and that what we do know isn't helping us. It's, it changes your perspective on life and on what you deserve and on the world in general. And so I think we've, the shift that I've seen both clinically and online and in my personal life is that there's less of an ability to ignore what needs to change. Because even, you know, it used to be when, even when there was just landlines, right? <laughs> that was it. Um, landlines and, and actual paper mail. Um, you could keep family secrets a secret. You could think you were the only one suffering. Um, and now we're at a place where even if we try to ignore our own suffering, we can open up an application and see other people's and then be reminded of our own. And so I think it's been an unintentional, absolutely necessary shift that's happened in these younger generations that are saying, this is so overwhelming. This just simply the amount of information and the ability to compare 
Like that's what's kind of said about social media a lot is the ability to compare. But it used to be like, you know, compare appearance. Now it's very much like if you are not in a in a beneficial place in society, your ability to compare your entire existence. I don't make enough money. I don't have a good job. I don't have a good body. I don't have a good personality. I'm not funny. I'm not creative. Like we have these younger generations have such an ability and we've been trained to do this, to figure out who are we supposed to be and how do we keep ourselves safe? It's very draining. And I think that it's human nature to try to find a solution to a problem that we're having. And I think a problem for these generations, millennial and lower, is that we can't avoid the pain. Mm. So we have to address it. And I think that's what's contributing to a reduction in stigma, more willingness to open up to therapy or some type of support in the therapy field. And I think that that is what is forcing the therapy field to have to shift and change because the demand is there. But if we can't supply what's actually going to help people, then it's not going to work. Yeah. I, you know, I've been working in the mental health field for um, somewhere between 10 and 15 years. So I've had the chance to kind of observe some shifts in a short amount of time too. So everything you're saying makes so much sense. I also grew up without the internet. Um, and now I get to kind of experience how that changes being in high school, being in college. Right. Um, and I'm hearing like, you know, this like access that we get through the World Wide Web to each other, to each other's thoughts, different perspectives. There's something about that, that in combination with all of us being a bit more introspective through the past few years, um, I think there's some difficulties and challenges that come with this. Uh, but it sounds like there's also a lot of power um, to be felt and shared in terms of taking back ownership of your own wellness, your own healing, your own journey. Um, so can you just say more about, you know, being in the space that you're in and what building an online mental health community means for people, how that contributes to, um, individual journeys. And even, you know, I'm sure this is all related to destigmatization. Like, uh, would just love to hear more of your thoughts on all of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I definitely sort of bagged on the internet and all of the ways that it's made um, these generations experience potentially more suffering. Um, but at the same time, it really has brought us together as well. And we can see that in in my communities. I mean, my first year, I had a goal of um, 5,000. Um, of you know members in my audience and within five months i was at half a million out of nowhere and what that really tells me um is that the internet can be a place of course for sensory and information overload but it can also be a place to find what it is that you're looking for that you may not be able to find in your own home, your own family, your friend group, your city, your state, maybe even your country, the accessibility of feeling like you're not alone is something that was not here 20, 30 years ago. If you felt alone, you may have been alone, you know, and that's, that's literally your physical location. That's every person you could have possibly come into contact to in your life or in contact with in your life. And now we have access to billions of people. If we want to have access to them, to realize that we're not alone, to realize that there are people that want to provide you education and information for free, such as myself, such as medical doctors and lawyers and, and the teachers that started making free accounts on YouTube for kids through the pandemic, we realize that as much as we see the suffering of the world with the accessibility of the internet, we also see the goodness of the people that live in it. And I think that that's really important for us to realize. And not only that, I think the internet has given us access to services like BetterHelp for people to get the help that they actually need. And we've seen this in so many different fields including the medical field and holistic treatment that people can receive that may not have been available in their state at all. 
And so, and that's like a big thing right now. States are becoming so different in what's allowed and what's not. And so having the ability to even get education or services from a hundred miles away matters. It really matters at this point. And so there's pros and cons to everything. And it's really just what corner of the internet have you found yourself in? Um, and is it beneficial or harmful? Yeah, it's, it sounds like kind of anything else in life is, is being mindful of what you're consuming and what you surround yourself with. Um, there's potential to go into spaces that aren't helpful for you, but there's also so much opportunity to connect with a lot of folks that can, um, like you said, help you feel like you're not alone in your experience. Um, and that's for folks that haven't tr taken that step and tried therapy before, that's part of this whole thing is learning and getting that education that you've referenced so many times before that like a lot of these things that people go through when they're suffering from something, it's so common as in not uncommon enough that it has a name. <laughs> There's words to it. There's ways that your therapist can help you explore this stuff, learn more about it, read about symptoms, um, which shows us that we're all quite similar, which something about that is, is very healing and helpful too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've talked quite a lot about um, just, I think the importance of finding the comfort within yourself to do something about your life. If something doesn't feel right, or if something doesn't feel good. Um, and we've kind of heard your tips about what to do when you're looking for a therapist, considering doing that kind of thing, um, shifting gears a little bit and bringing people back to their personal lives. Um, First, like, do you think it's important for people to share with everybody, like, I'm in therapy, um, and then however you answer that, if you think it's important or if you don't, like, when's a good time to bring this up? Does it make sense to bring it up? Like, I'm, I'm even scattered asking this question because mm -hmm. I think where I'm coming from is, like, we want to talk about therapy more to destigmatize, but at an individual level, it might not feel comfortable to do that. So I don't know if folks out there are having that mm. question too, of like, I want to be part of this movement to make it normal, but does that mean I have to talk about it with people? And would just love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. There's many different ways to make change. There's mm. many different ways to reduce stigma. If you are in therapy and no one knows if you have children or if you have friends or parents even, and they eventually say to you, I'm in therapy, your the fact that you won't judge them reduces stigma. Like it does, it, it allows you to have a conversation that isn't a stigmatized conversation. And that does make change. It's very much the butterfly effect. Then you make that person feel better and then maybe they go and someone tells them that they're in therapy and that is an ability to destigmatize. It's it's someone else saying I'm in therapy and you not responding with why, even if you're not like I am too, you know, it doesn't have to be overt expressions of I'm getting this help because I need it. It's also just in in yourself reducing the stigma of going, of saying it's okay to just go and making that the change that you're contributing to yourself, your relationship, your family, the world, eventually, like eventually every action that we do, it, it affects every future action in many ways. Um, I also think it's okay to totally come out and say it. And I think that there's a few things to consider if you're in therapy and, and, you, and you know, maybe it's not, um, let me make a wild millions of person platform to say I'm in therapy and I'm a therapist. Um, but I think it can also just be, you know, I think therapy initially is you want to know what you've gotten yourself into. You want to learn about yourself to a degree. Um, and I also think it's important to sort of map out what those conversations are going to be like. So it's not a secret to say you're in therapy or to be in therapy and not say anything doesn't mean you're keeping a secret. It means you're holding a boundary for yourself as you learn about yourself and your experiences. Um, but it can also be good to talk in therapy about what these conversations might look like. You know, it can't, it's not very comfortable 
to eventually tell your parents that you're in therapy because you struggled throughout your childhood or to say to your partner, I'm in therapy because I've been feeling really disconnected from you and like I don't have support for my anxiety. It's not easy to do that um, because there could be defense coming from the other side when all you're really trying to do is let them in to what your life looks like right now. And so you can always have those conversations in therapy with your therapist. You can role play them. You can come up with multiple solutions or an out if it's not going well. And I think the last thing I'll say is, and and it can go wonderfully. So I'm giving examples of like how it it might be difficult, but it could go really wonderfully. and, And I would love for that to be the case for each person. And if there's concern, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you verbalize. It could be something that you write in a letter. It could be something that you text. It could be something where you want to verbalize it, but you plan a specific time and a specific day and you start the conversation with, I'm going to tell you something that I feel really vulnerable saying, and I'm a little nervous what your response is going to be, but I, I think it's important that you know where I'm at right now so there's lots of options there's lots of ways that it can go you can say it or not say it shout it online or just tell one person closest to you or tell nobody it's your life and your health and your well-being and if you're getting yourself the help that you need then that is by far the most important thing and not who knows Mm -hmm. and i'm i'm hearing you say like you don't necessarily need to be the one saying I'm in therapy to help be part of the movement to destigmatize. So, um, you know, if, if you're out there, if you're somebody out there that's wanting to help your friends feel comfortable with the idea of talking about it so that you have a window to talk about it too. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of ways that you can do this by just being open. And I think part of learning to become an open person is about like, you know, examining yourself and finding the places where you are closed off. Um, So I think there's, what I'm hearing is like, there's, there's so many things that you can do as a person on an individual level. And there's many things that you can be doing, even if you're not a therapist, um, to help all of us continue moving towards a place where it's just as normal to seek a therapist as it is to like get a dental cleaning. Um, You know, nobody's really judging you for doing that, if anything. (laughs) Nowadays, it's like, you know, our, our, uh, collective opinions about going to see a doctor for whatever reason. I think even that has changed within different cultures over the past, like couple of decades. Um, and it seems like we're kind of at the pivotal point of what this means for mental health. Um, you know, and like I said, I, I loved everything that you have summed up when it comes to. Um, these observations we're having with like folks that are generally really in their twenties, thirties, and forties now, and how they're experiencing the world differently because of this greater access to each other, to different ideas, to share things, um, Mm -hmm. that we don't live in little vacuums anymore. And, um, there's so much that everybody could be doing. So, Mm -hmm. um, uh, really appreciate all your time and expertise. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our community here when it comes to the the really brilliant work that you're doing out there? Mm, well, thank you. Um, I, <laughs> I'm actually, I, what I'm referencing in my head right now is um, these stickers that I have that are on the back of my laptop right now. Um, and you know, they say very cheesy mental health lines, but I think that they're really important. And two of them are just, it's okay to not be okay. And I know that if if you've made it to watching this video or listening to it, then you've probably heard that before, that it's okay to not be okay. Um, but it really is. And from a licensed therapist who is rarely okay, um, <laughs> it is okay to not be okay and you can still push through. And also you're doing a good job and it might not feel like it. And I think one thing to consider is if you only have 40% to give in any day and you give that 40%, then you gave a hundred, you gave everything you could. And so please keep that in mind, whether you are in therapy, thinking about going to therapy, will never go to therapy because of your opinions about it, whatever it is. 
It's okay to not be okay. And you're doing a good job. And thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, and for anybody that's feeling the warm and fuzzies and wants to continue following your content mm-hmm. and seeing what you continue to share with all of us, where can folks find you? Um, you can find me on TikTok, Instagram, or YouTube at the period truth period doctor. And my website is the truth doctor.com. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we'll link all that. And, um, Yeah. Thank you again for, for your time and your wisdom and hope you have a great rest of your day. Of course. Thank you. 